Welcome, everybody. Today, we have the great honor to interview Professor Stuart Green, head of the Medical Physics Department of University Hospital in Birmingham in UK. Good morning, Professor Green. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Valeria. <laughs> I'm Valeria Monti. With me conducting the interview today is Naonori Ko from Osaka Medical College. Hi, Naonori. Hello. Hi. In one of the last newsletter of ISNCT, we have read about uh, an interesting article about uh, the uh, neutron facility, the future neutron facility in Birmingham. But today, we would like to ask Professor Green about uh, his experience as a medical physicist. So I would like to start with a simple question. Can you briefly summarize your extended experience on uh, hydron therapy? BNCT on one side and proton and ion therapy on the other side. Yes, I, I can. Uh, I can try. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So my uh, my interest in in medical physics actually started uh, in the 1980s. So that's a long time ago now. I was doing my PhD in Birmingham, uh, actually in in relation to uh, the neutron transport side of uh, fusion fusion uh, power. Uh, so the neutronic side and tritium production and things like that. Uh, but I was working with a group in Birmingham who were uh, focused on uh, the medical physics aspects and the, uh, of the neutron therapy program, the fast neutron therapy program, which was happening in the UK at the time uh, in Clatterbridge uh, on the Wirral uh, in the north of England. <clears throat> so uh, because they were the main group interested in neutrons, I, I was working with them because my project was also with neutrons in, uh, in the fusion uh, side. So I gradually became more and more interested in, in medical applications by working working with them. And so my interest started with hadron therapy, with uh, with fast neutron therapy. And through that, we started to work a little bit on the dosimetry and microdosimetry of proton therapy, because the Clatterbridge team were developing their proton therapy line at the same time for treatment of eye cancers. So my whole experience of medical physics started in this area of hadron therapy. And then I moved into more conventional medical physics in the hospital in, in, in Birmingham. And then the opportunity to work on BNCT came through the research in the university here with the uh, Dynamotron Accelerator, uh, which is still in the building but hasn't run for some years now. Um, and, and we gradually started to, to, to realize that, that actually an accelerator like that with that power uh, could, could do a lot in, in BNCT. Because at the time, of course, everybody was focused on, on nuclear reactors. Um, so we worked with PhD students, a lot of very good PhD students over probably about 10 years from the middle of the 1990s to the middle of the 2005, roughly. Um, and in the end, you know, we, we managed to publish some papers, which I think show that you could really do this with an accelerator for, for BNCT. Um, so I kind of moved from the neutron and proton therapy side towards BNCT. Uh, and but. All, in, all the time in the background working in conventional x-ray radiotherapy and uh, radiation protection and, and those areas in, in the hospital. Uh, so, so I was never really, apart from the first few years as a researcher, uh, I've, all of this work in BNCT has been kind of done in my spare time uh, when my day job has been in, uh, in, in, in the hospital um, with you know, many patients coming through. So we're, at, we're the regional center for cancer treatment in, in Birmingham. So the specialist center for the West Midlands uh, so that's a catchment population of about 6 million people. Uh, so all of the complicated radiotherapy cases come, come to us. Um, so, you know, that, that work continued. We, we made a little bit of progress with the BNCT, started to look more at the radiation biology of this accelerator beam to show how, um, compared to a reactor beam, how much less damaging this, this beam can be to healthy tissues. So I think that's, those are really positive things going forward for BNCT. Um, and then, but after a while, it seemed, you know, our old accelerator uh, wasn't really going to actually be used for treating patients. Um, it didn't really have the reliability, really wasn't quite powerful enough um, for, for a convenient treatment. So we could treat, we could uh, run the beam at a proton current of about one milliamp. And really, you need something, you know, at least five, probably. Uh, but uh, people say 10, people say 20, but, you know, at least five. Um, so, you know, th that started to uh, become less of a priority and we started to do some more research on, uh, on proton therapy, particularly proton imaging, uh, proton CT. Uh, and a lot of that research used 
the cyclotron, which is also in the University in Birmingham, in the same building as our dynamotron, which is a 40 MeV proton cyclotron, uh, can accelerate other ions as well. So actually, you know, in in, uh, in proton therapy, all the really interesting things happen around the Bragg peak. Uh, and, and with a 40 MeV machine, you can actually produce a lot of those very interesting uh, uh, physics effects, uh, which come at the end of the range of a 200 MeV beam in clinical use. So, so, so we then started to work more on proton therapy. Uh, and, but it's come kind of coming full circle now. The, the cyclotron is working very well. Um, we can still do that research, but we now have this new uh, neutron source accelerator coming in so we can uh, start to think more and more about preclinical work on, on BNCT. So it's, all of this has been going on in the background, I guess, while I've been uh, working through life as a hospital medical physicist uh, and now uh, uh, head of the department of about, we have about 130 staff in medical physics in Birmingham working across radiotherapy physics, nuclear medicine, uh, radiation protection, and we have a small computing group. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on in, uh, in, in the hospital always, as you can imagine, especially in the last few years, but uh, uh, we're trying to keep uh, some active research to try and uh, develop this great technique, particularly BNCT. Yeah, um, that's uh, it's very interesting how you mentioned that you know, there's a lot of uh, research going on. You mentioned proton therapy and also BNCT and fast, fast neutron therapy uh, sort of research is what really got um, you really involved in the medical physics sort of community. So it's very interesting to hear those uh, stories. Um, so if I may ask, um, which are the main differences that you have met during your research on conventional hadron therapy and during your research on BNCT? I think that probably the big difference is, uh, is the BNCT community and the BNCT conferences is so multidisciplinary. You know, you can't really have any conversation with BNCT without straying somehow outside your area of expertise and realizing you're suddenly accidentally talking about chemistry or biology, which as a physicist, you know, I, I don't know much about. So, so you have to be con consciously and, and constantly aware of that, that you're likely to stray into areas that you actually really are not an expert. But somehow in BNCT, everybody is in the same position because it is such a complicated multidisciplinary field. Uh, but that's what makes it so such a wonderful community, I think. You know, it's such a uh, um, so the experience of going, for example, to the, uh, the the meetings every two years, I think, is a is a very positive experience because you interact so closely with, you know, the neurosurgeons in Japan that lead the uh, the, the groups that are often there, and with chemists looking at uh, new boron compounds, radiobiologists, you know, who have uh, uh, a, a, a completely different kind of understanding of what happens in cells when they experience uh, radiation than, than I do. So that's very, very striking about the BNCT community, the way it's such a mesh of different uh, expertise, which you, you need to have any kind of conversation. And I, and I find that's a bit different in, in, in conventional radiotherapy. Although we, we try to work together across all of the professional boundaries, um, I don't think don't think it happens as well and I don't think it's quite as necessary you know uh, uh, medical physics uh, advances in in an area of dosimetry or uh, some technical aspects of proton therapy of course you need to engage with your clinical colleagues and with the uh, radiation therapists the radiographers who will uh, use the equipment and deliver the treatment but it's 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 done it in a different way I think some of the, the science developments can happen first and then you start to talk to your colleagues about how the clinical implementation could happen. Whereas in BNCT, you have to start all together right from the start. Uh, otherwise, you don't make uh, good progress. So they are, they are different. They're very uh, rewarding fields, of course, both of them. But uh, they, I think they are different. What do you see for the future of BNCT and proton therapy? Will they be alternative solutions or uh, complementary possibilities? Uh, so I, I, I think they're complementary. Um, I mean, who, who will know, who will say in 20 years time where, where we will be, but you know, as far as I can see in the future, I think they're complementary. Um, uh, proton therapy uh, is a fantastic technique for delivering radiation dose to a tumor where you can, uh, or a target which you, where you can image, you, you, you know, the very full powerful uh, modern imaging techniques, you can see as much of the disease as you believe is really there and you can treat it with uh, 
proton therapy and also modern x-ray radiotherapy is a very sophisticated uh, technique. Um, so but BNCT is, is for that disease where you really, maybe you can see some of it, but you know there's a lot more there, uh, which is infiltrating around, uh, um, around the primary tumor, which you can, you can visualize. Um, so I think you know, that it's quite unique in that ability to try to deliver dose to those infiltrating cells wherever they are around the, around the tumor. We have very few, very few techniques like that. Um, and, and, and those tumors are some of the most difficult. Those infil locally infiltrating radio resistant tumors, they're some of the most difficult to treat. Um, so I think it's quite complementary. And I, and I also think, you know, for example, with the uh, glioblastoma, you know, it's a horrible, horrible tumor. But actually, with uh, X ray radiotherapy, um, we tend to control the disease within the central volume of the, of the tumor. You know, those, those tumors tend to recur after treatment within the margin where the um, where the prime the main dose that we've delivered with x-ray radiotherapy is starting to fall off so actually you know maybe the future really is is to combine bnct and proton and sorry and uh, proton therapy or x-ray radiotherapy up front as we as we deliver it uh, because what we absolutely can't do with conventional uh, beam beam type treatments like protons or, or x-rays is, is treat that disease which is infiltrating away from the, the central tumor so I think they're very complementary. I mean, we'll see what the research uh, shows over the next uh, 10 years, hopefully, but uh, I don't think one will replace the other. Okay. Um, can you tell us a fact which gave you uh, a great satisfaction as a medical physicist? Oh, yeah. So that's a good question. Um, so I don't know. So, I, I mean, one of the most satisfying experiences I've had, I think, as a medical physicist was a kind of a, an, an intense year of work, which we did when we were trying to commission our dynamotron accelerator for clinical BNCT. Uh, so we, we, we started with an accelerator, which was, you know, hadn't been properly well maintained, wasn't really um, uh, even capable of running re reliably at uh, the milliamp uh, type beam currents, which we, we, we felt we needed. Um, and over a period of probably about 15 months, we got it running reliably and went through a kind of three or four month period of intense commissioning work, dosimetry work and cell radiobiology work uh, to, to get to the point where we felt we had a beam, we knew what the beam looked like, we had a treatment planning system, um, uh, um, which was NCT plan uh, we were using in those in those days, um, where we felt, you know, if somebody had provided us with a patient, we could have actually treated them. Um, so but that was that I felt that was a really great team effort, pulling in the, you know, the technical staff on the accelerator, uh, colleagues from nuclear physics in Birmingham, uh, medical colleagues as well, medical physics trainees uh, who are doing their projects with us. So that was a great ex experience. Uh, of course, the disappointment came because we didn't actually move on to treat anybody with that uh, uh, beam. Uh, but uh, it was uh, it was a great project, really great project. So I really... Uh, I really enjoyed that. It was a long time ago now. You know, that was 2003, 2004 when we did that uh, that work. But uh, there have been more in, in, other enjoyable things since then. Uh, but uh, that, that does stick in my mind. Thank you. We know that you were one of the founders of the Young BNCT meetings. So yeah. what is today your piece of advice for young people who want to start uh, research in BNCT? So I think, so I'd say advice in kind of two areas. One is in terms of research, it's, an, it's a fantastic field. And I think what we've seen in, um, for example, in proton therapy, you know, people who uh, made that their research topic 20 years ago were, were, you know, really some of the kind of key people in the field who then went on to have amazing careers in these proton therapy centers and and had opportunities to go and work in all kinds of different places that you perhaps don't even think of when you are starting your phd and i think there's a good chance that bnct is at that phase now so for a younger researcher coming into the bnct field now uh, seeing the, the numbers of accelerators which are coming you know and we and you have to believe from one of the things from the uh, experience with the vaccines with the covid crisis is that we we really are now starting to understand a bit more about biology and a bit, a bit more about chemistry. Uh, and, you know, the, those vaccines are an incredible scientific success. And, and I, I do believe there are big scientific successes to come in the, in the field of boron compounds uh, for BNCT. 
So you put those together with the accelerators, and I think this could be a really exciting uh, career path for people for the next 20 years. You know, or, uh, you can never really see further than five years, can you? But you know, for you know, for a, for a, for a, for a good part of your career, I think it's a really, hopefully, a very very rewarding field to be in, um, and a great community to be part of. Uh, and in terms of the community, and 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 for example, the International Society, and and that young members uh, meeting that you that you mentioned. So the, part of the motivation from that for that young members meeting was that uh, a group of us were at the final session of the uh, the BNCT conference, which was in La Jolla in uh, in California, which is a wonderful place to visit as well. Um, and we'd been participating in the meeting all all week, and then and then we got to the end of the conference and the final session, and the the whole discussion was led by. Uh, basically these old guys, like I'm an old guy now, but basically led by these old guys who we hadn't really seen during the meeting. They didn't seem to be part of the scientific community, but they were deciding what was going to happen. And, and we came away thinking, well, well I don't think we really like that. <laughs> um, let, let's have an alternative. Uh, let's try and get the young members together. Uh, and that discussion, uh, particularly, I'd say, uh, Wilco Verbackel, who was then doing his PhD in, uh, in, in Petten, really after those conversations he really took that initiative and made that society so i'd say to the young younger younger members in our community that they you know in the end the society needs you more than you need it because without you there is no society in the future so you should feel that you have that uh, you have feel that have you have that power um and uh use it for good 